Production funding is provided by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic. In this edition, we'll hear a Native American story, learn about church restoration, and visit with a metal sculptor who crossed the Iron Curtain in the late 1960s to practice his art. But first, we'll take a trip to Moorhead, Minnesota for a profile of one of our region's leading arts administrators. James O'Rourke curates new artwork ranging from pottery and handicraft art to abstract paintings. The permanent collection of the Rourke Art Gallery includes pieces by Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein, as well as many of the region's top artists. Let's visit with James O'Rourke as he talks about his philosophy of art collection and the history of the Rourke Gallery. Well, we want the best. <laughs> But you're, you're obviously you're, you're, you're trying to exhibit the, the finest artists that live in the Fargo-Moorhead area particularly and then the Red River Valley and then we move out to western Minnesota and North Dakota sort of our general area where most of our members come from and also where the artists that have one person shows here. We uh, have a strong commitment to uh, artists of our time and place. We've done this from the day we opened. I think that museums are sort of a, doing a disservice to their artists in their own community if they do not exhibit their work. There was no art gallery or museum in Fargo-Moorhead in 1960. My brother Orlin and I uh, decided we should start a, a gallery and it eventually would evolve into a museum. I had uh, spent the three previous years living in Nuremberg, Germany. Prior to that, out east a lot and there were a lot of galleries and museums, so uh, we uh, started the, the gallery. I signed a two-year lease for the building downtown, then uh, decided that we should have that house. And uh, I suppose you have to be 25 years old to actually buy another house and you're losing about $500 a month and uh, buy another building and have a two-year lease on another one and so on. The whole thing was pretty bizarre. I consider the most beautiful old building in Fargo Moorhead for the museum. And we have, uh, the building was built in 1913. It's the Federal Post Office building. And people that, particularly out of the area that come here from uh, the cities and so on, always marvel at this really handsome building. We have some permanent collection things out of the gallery too, because we have just so many things in, in the permanent collections. Right now, we have the works from the Native American collections are out at the gallery, as well as some of the contemporary, what we call nervous art, sort of art that. Uh, moves around a lot. It's upstairs at the Rourke. And I suppose as the years go by, more and more of the gallery will have to be used for the permanent collection as well. You know, to be a, what we call an encyclopedic museum that we would actually show all different cultures and so on, not just art of the Midwest, which is the largest part of our, both of our temporary exhibitions. But we also have a great collection of American pop art because at the time, it, um, in the 1960s, it, you, we were able to buy pop art things very, very inexpensively. So that's, we ended up with some unbelievably fine pieces of work by Andy Warhol and um, Lichtenstein and J James Rosenquist, who is from the Red River Valley. A lot of the permanent collection ends up being gifts from people. They offer you things that they might have. They, instead of selling it, a lot of people are very generous and just as soon give it to the museum so it's taken care of and permanently here. Part of the time, I, I guess I do occasionally ask people for art or ask them more often for money to buy art with. It's probably more often that 
we get money that way. We have often sometimes three to four different exhibitions, particularly in this building or the gallery. Um, the gallery with three, we have things in the, right now, the Native American collection is actually in the lower level, the basement level of the Rourke Gallery right now. And uh, there's things on the second floor and the main floor. When, when we became 10 years old back in 1970, I know the, the Minneapolis Tribune sent out a photographer and a writer. So they, the whole idea that an art gallery survived 10 years in, in Minnesota was a, a real record. But it's a combination of uh, selling art Selling, having memberships, getting grants from the Minnesota State Arts Board, the North Dakota State Arts Council, the Lake Local uh, Arts Councils, and uh, donations from businesses. A little bit of everything, I suppose. I like working here. We have museum studies uh, students at, from Concordia and a, a program where they get college credit for working here. So I always tell the students, we've had anywhere from up to, I guess, 10 to 25 or so working here all the time from the three colleges, MS, Concordia, and SU over the years. And I always tell them when they come to work is that how much fun it is to have a job where you just come and you look at art, you handle art, you talk to artists, and you talk to art collectors and patrons, and they're all really nice people, all these things. It's just sort of a lot better than uh, you know, probably selling shoes in a shoe department or working in the kitchen of a, uh, of a fast food restaurant or something. So, you know, it's just plain enjoyable to work in a place with art and artists. So I, that's all I ever uh, do or think about, I suppose, is art. Keith Bear is a world-renowned Mandan Hadatsa storyteller and musician from the three affiliated tribes in Fort Berthold, North Dakota. He shares the rich history of his people through new and traditional Native American songs and stories, many of which have been passed down for hundreds of years. I started telling these stories to my children. These are stories that I heard as a child as I grew up. My name is O Mashiru Ta'a in the language of my mother, the Nuata people. This was given to me when I joined the military. This is my man's name. This name in the Nuata language translates to the bright light that waves in the north sky. And in English, my name is Northern Lights. My everyday name in the day I name I go by, the white man's name was given to me as a child is Keith Bear. A lot of people from around America would come to visit at our home. When they would come to visit, they would bring stories about their people. As a child, I, I, I was fascinated with those stories because they were so good. I wanted to be like those guys. They are to entertain, but they're also to teach. And they tell a story about a person or a thing that's happening or wants to happen. You can use them to call for something. You can use them to bless something. You can use them for prayers, you can use them for love, you can use them for war, your exploits. So when I would tell these two non-Indian people, trying to describe it, you know, using the, the war club, you know, it's not just a rock and a stick, you know, this is, this is a grandfather, this rock is somebody who has been here forever. And this stick is part of that tree of life, you know, and you use that to build your home, you use it to cook your food, you use it to hunt with, and you use it now to protect the people. It just depends on what uh, item you're talking about because everything that we have has a story. There's also that singular power. You have the opportunity to become something more than what you are with the stories, to do your best at whatever you can. Maybe we're not always the best. You know, we have a lot of our stories that say, well, that didn't quite work out that time, you know, for the coyote, or didn't, didn't work out in that love way for this man, or you know, in that war aspect, you know, he had to learn things. And so we're not always the, uh, a success, but we learn to deal with life. Realizing that life has failures, that we need to teach our children how to deal with that. There's more to the story than just the words. It's, it's the... It's the thought concept, it's the physical process of those animals, of those stories and the imagination that are just 
Uh, thought provoking for these children, that's what we want them to do, think. Here along the big smoky waters, today it's called the Missouri River. We, the Nuata, we have always lived here. We have lived here for many generations, and over those generations, we were known far and wide as generous people. We were known far and wide as those who have the best gardens. And so they would come from the north, the east, the south, and the west, and they would gather here along the shores of this great river. And when they came, they would bring things from the mountains that we don't have. They would bring things from the north that we don't have, the south and the east. Here they would gather. When they would gather, there would be good trading, and there would be good songs, and there would be lots of good dancing. And many relatives were made, and a lot of children came the next year. So when these people come, everybody gathers. You know, we may have been enemies last week, maybe last month. But when they come, they raise their hand, and they come in peace. We have set aside our differences. And there was a time when this young man, he lived there in the village, and they knew what the people, and his name was Turtle. He was raised by his grandparents because his mother and father had left this world. And this child was a little bit slow and they called him Turtle because he would just lay there and looked with those big, beautiful brown eyes. And he was always quiet, just like a turtle. And so they taught him, the uncles would take him and show him how to make a bow. The grandfather took him and showed him how to hunt. The grandmother showed him songs and things about the how to make moccasins and how to make good things. The uncles and those who taught him the ways of war and the ways of men, they taught him very well. And as he grew, he became known for his generosity. When he went hunting, he always brought back things for those men that had been injured in war. He gave things to those women who had children and no man. He gave things to the elders who had very few to hunt for them, take care of them. But he always provided for his grandparents, who did a very good job of raising him. Someone is coming, they said. There are many horses coming, prepare yourselves. They didn't know to prepare for battle or for war or for friendship. We always were ready to fight. And so we were ready when we heard them coming over the hills and they brought all those horses. They were singing the song, the Uzubushka horses. They were singing songs of those horses about how they danced and how they were beautiful in the sunlight. And as they came into the village, the people were happy. It was like thunder upon the ground and all that dust was flying. And in the middle of that dust, there was one beautiful voice that he heard. So Turtle, he watched as those horses went by and the dust cleared a little bit. And he saw the long flaxen hair, just like a raven's wing, just dark and beautiful, blue, shining. And the voice that came out was just beautiful. And it found a place in his heart. That night, that's all he could think about. And that night, he said, all through the night I have dreamed of you. And all through the night you have been my dream. I awoke this morning and I sat upon the hill and I waited for you to bring sunlight into the day. As I sat, I twisted sweet grass with the flowers that grow. When you kept from your lodge, you stepped upon the earth, the sun began to shine. The birds began to sing. The butterflies began to dance and my heart began to pound. When you walked towards me, I wanted to say beautiful things to you. But when I looked into your eyes, I became lost. My mind was like a cloud, I could not think. And my tongue was so thick, I could not speak. I lowered my eyes to the ground and I raised my hand with this bracelet. And you took it from me as you walked past. And I turned and I looked after her and I said, there goes the light of my life. There goes the source of my desire. There goes the woman of my dream. And all through the night I've dreamed of you. And all through the night I shall dream of you again. One morning he took that chance when he seen the brother taking the horses to water. He crawled through the grass. He crawled up behind her and he got close enough and he took a stick and he poked her in the ankle and she lifted her ankle and she said, what are you doing here? Don't you know my brothers will beat you? What are you doing here? He said, I had to find out your name. Don't you know that they're going to kill you? He said, death would be sweet. I have to know your name. She said, my name is Pretty Crane. And you, you look just like a turtle in the grass. And he said, that's who I am. I am turtle of the Nuata people. And several times they met like this. 
down by the river. And so he made a song for her, a song that made him feel good. Oh, my honey, don't you know that I'll be with you tonight? We'll go walking by the water. We'll hold hands in the moonlight. Way I ha ya hare o yo hare o ya hero. Way ah ya hare o yo hare o ya hero. Way ho ya hero. But you know, we have stories. And if you look down there in the springtime, if you look down there in the summer or in the fall, you watch. Have you seen them cranes? You can hear them calling. You watch down there by the river. Do you see that one standing on one leg? Is she talking to a turtle? You see, that's what we believe. We believe that she was given back as a spirit. And we believe that his spirit went to join her. And they were put back on this earth to inspire a young man. Take your time. Have a strong heart. Her voice gave beauty to the earth. Her love gave strength to a man. And so that's the way it was long ago. The prairie landscape is dotted with steeples, onion domes, and turrets of hundreds of prairie churches. Preserving these architectural gems is the mission of an unusual project that spans the border between the U.S. and Canada. Over and over and over again, the people who are most familiar with these little rural heritage gems are the least impressed by them because they're so used to them. They've seen them all their lives and they seem to have an impression that it's the same way all over. They're, they're everywhere, so why should we save this one? And it takes someone who's not from the area to say, no, this is really special. You guys really have to do something with this. The Manitoba Prairie Church's project has two principal funders. It's the Thomas Sill Foundation of Winnipeg and the Kaplan Fund out of New York City. Being with the Manitoba Culture, Heritage and Tourism Historic Resources Branch, we often help people when they come to us to try and organize a project to, to, to save something. Got a call from the Kaplan Fund in New York City, and they were funding a Prairie Churches program in Saskatchewan and North Dakota. It was like a cross-border uh, Northern Plains thing that they were doing. And they were saying, oh, well, do you have any interesting churches in Manitoba? And I go, oh, do we have interesting churches? We probably have the best variety of country churches in the whole continent, you have to come see them. Here we've got Mennonites and Poles, uh, Icelanders, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful variety. And the churches are part of that cultural landscape, which again, sadly, is, is disappearing. And if you are fortunate enough to drive around and, and, and see some of these, you'll see what I mean. They're all different. Some are just spectacular churches. I don't know who the architects were. Some look like Turkish mosques. Some look like simple little gable roofs with a teeny weeny little dome where you know, the babas and the grandpas and the grandkids all came to help out. We've got quite a few churches that are preserved. There's a couple of churches not far from here that haven't been used as churches since the mid-60s. And they're just now religious landmarks. The people who used to go there uh, or, or who have family buried there, they go back and they cut the grass and paint the church every 10 years and roof it. And it hasn't been used like for 30 years as a church, but it's this wonderful landmark in the countryside, you know, attesting to the settlers and, and, and what once was here. So even though it's only used once a year or not at all, doesn't mean you can't save it as a landmark. So every little one's a big success because it's part of the cultural landscape. And it would be really, really sad to have what used to be, you know, a landscape dotted with grain elevators and, and, and churches and domes poking up over the tree line and it has nothing on the landscape. So things like this are, are very important to, to preserve. Born in Budapest, Hungary, Richard Seitz was influenced by the Baroque surroundings of his childhood. Longing to express himself creatively, he crossed the Iron Curtain to study art in America, and since the late 1960s, sculptural projects have dominated his creative output. During his 25 years as chairman of the Minnesota State University Moorhead Art Department, 
He continued producing his signature brazed copper fountains and sculptures. His work is showcased across the country. I start to make uh, small sketches, what people call thumbnails. After I selected a pencil sketch, I scan it into the computer and refine it, and uh, this is the final result. From this, I make an enlargement, what you can see here. This is in scale what actually I like to come up with as a full height of the sculpture. After I have done the scale drawing, uh, then I make just a, a skeletal drawing. This is for the purpose to create the wire mesh mock-up, which will serve as a pattern making device. Well, I brought me in Budapest, Hungary. The communist uh, government took over and started to harass lots of people, uh, among those some of my teachers and friends. So I thought it's better if I leave the country. And I crossed the Iron Curtain. After that, I came to Minnesota State University, Moorhead. I was hired as the chairman of the art department. I was holding that position and teaching for 25 years. My parents uh, always encouraged the kind of play or, or experimentation when I was doing as a child. My father was an architect and I was always around design activities and constructions. As a child, I used the materials which was around, and I always made something. After I have the paper pattern, then I put it on a sheet of copper and cut out the piece of what I made the pattern for. And at this point, the copper is still very springy and brittle it would be hard to form it, so I have to first anneal it. This is to rearrange the molecular structure of the metal. Interlocking, it is more parallel, and that's what makes it soft. The next step is to hammer out. This is, is the general shape of the wing. Now I, I have to go over a couple of more times in various ways to find or shape it, but this is essentially the way it is shaped. I can use these smaller chisels, create some lines. Usually what I do, I make some guidelines for the feathers. And use a chisel to make the creases and then after it is creased then I can further shape it with the help of a plier so that it creates the topography of, of feathers. When all the parts are hammered out like this then start to assemble it. I had a student, her father was an architect who, who, who was designing West Acres. He heard that I was making fountain sculpture. He wanted to have a fountain of abundance. This is why I came up with this idea of sort of wheat type of abstract forms. As the crop grows very often, birds get into the crop and this is why I put the cranes in it. 
usually kids around uh, they like to put their hand in the water and play with it. Well, I'm, I'm glad to see that. Almost the last step is attaching the legs. I have the base part of the foot. So what I'm doing is bracing on the toes. Bracing is material which is an alloy of a mixture of metals and has a lower uh, melting temperature than the metal you are brazing. You put this. No, I dip it in water because that way it cools up much faster and I can handle it. Pieces of pipe, but I don't uh, like to look like pieces of pipe. <laughs> it's nice to do something what uh, you like to do and you are interested in, but the work is work. <laughs> So it's, it's not always easy. Production funding is provided by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and the members of Prairie Public.